Good morning, everyone. My name is Matthew Dickens. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this morning and our um, Accessibility and Disability Policy webinar series. Today, we're going to focus on Law Enforcement Interaction Program. We've invited Officer James Sabota from the Houston Police Department to discuss his program. So I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca to talk a little bit about the GCPD. So just to explain a little bit about the GCPD, which is the Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities, um, our mission is to further opportunities for persons with disabilities to enjoy full and equal access to lives of independence, productivity, and self-determination. GCPD recommends changes in disability policies and programs in the areas of accessibility, communication, criminal justice, education, emergency preparedness, employment, health, housing, transportation, and veterans. The committee also supports a network of committees on people with disabilities in the, locally throughout the state. We issue awards to promote greater awareness and promote compliance with disability related laws. Today's webinar will focus on criminal justice. Thank you, Rebecca. So now if you have questions, I, I want to say that the uh, chat is disabled. So please use, please use the Q&A feature and we will most likely answer those questions at the end of our talk today. We'll let Officer Sabota um, talk about his experiences and then we'll answer some questions. And I may have some questions for Officer Sabota as well. Um, if you, you need to know who to contact in your local community, the best place to start um, might be the city or county police department and the liaison there. And you may have a local committee on peoples with disabilities. And Officer Sabota may have more resources for you as well. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Officer James Sabota and hear about his experiences. Good morning to everyone. And I want to thank you all for allowing me to present this morning. Uh, I'm actually very exciting uh, to do so. Um, as introduced, my name is Officer James Sabota. Moving forward, you can call me James or James Sabota if it makes you comfortable. Um, just to give you a quick bio about myself, I'm born and raised here in the city of Houston. And, um, you know, noticing growing up in the inner city, I was born and raised in a, in a very um, diverse part of town, an older part of town. And growing up in Houston as a young boy, I remember seeing police officers when we were outside playing ball on the streets. Uh, I remember seeing police officers drive by. And, you know, as young boys and girls, we would see police officers drive by. We were excited and we tried to wave at them and because uh, it was just exciting to see a police officer. But one thing I did notice uh, back when I was younger that police officers, they weren't quite as engaged into the community. And I wouldn't say they were not friendly, but they just uh, were doing a job and they didn't work with the, with the community that much. So in 1985, I wanted to join the police department and I joined the Houston Police Department. And, um, you know, when I, when I started, when I joined, I end up asking some of these officers that probably at the time they had 30 years on and they were probably some of the same officers that we waved at when we were young children. And I asked them, I said, why did you not wave back to us or why were you not that friendly to the community? And, and they simply replied. They said that, you know, we just had a job to do. We were answering calls for service. So they were very just reactive to what, when they were called to scenes, crime scenes or, or any type of police service needed. So when I joined the police department, I worked actually more than 20 years on the streets. And 
um, I worked, you know, all throughout the city of Houston. I worked on many different squads, ran hundreds, if not thousands of calls for service. And, but the first six months in the police academy, I noticed that when we were through our training and here at the Houston Police Department, we have great training uh, even years ago, but I did notice that we had absolutely no training whatsoever regarding dealing with anybody who had any type of disability. Um, and I noticed that. So during those 20 plus years, when we were all running calls for service, dealing with the public, um, whether it's a, it was just a, a simple burglary or, 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 but a traffic stop, um, we encountered people with different disabilities. And some of those people that we encountered on calls for service were deaf or hard of hearing. So, you know, being that we had no formal training whatsoever, um, we, we did our very best. We try to note, write notes back and forth with, with each other. Um, and also, uh, when, when it was a more serious crime that, in my opinion, we needed some type of um, interpreter, those options were not there. So whether myself or whether another investigator had to ask them serious questions, uh, we just wrote notes back and forth with each other. Now, after my 20 plus years on the streets at the time, um, right around 2004, the chief called me in the office and he asked me to take over uh, our program by the name of the Chief Citywide Positive Interaction program or PIP for short. And um, I was I was told to take over the program and I said, yes, sir, I will do this. So, and I'll explain to you all what the PIP program is all about. What we learned in the city of Houston for many, many years, if not decades, that as I indicated before, that when the whenever the police were called to a scene, we took the information, we made arrest, or we made a report, and then it went to the desk of the investigators. And that was sort of the end of it. But what we found out in the late 90s and into the early 2000s is um, there on the west side of Houston, there was a lot of burglaries that was going happening in one neighborhood. And so we were making a lot of police reports. And what we found out that some citizens came to the station uh, and they said, hey, maybe we know who some of the suspects are. We've seen, we've got license plate numbers and maybe some, we took some pictures of these suspects. So we invited them to the station and make a long story short, what these great citizens, they provided us information. We found out that uh, the information they provided to us led us to the arrest of a burglary ring. So what we did then, we invited these same citizens to the police station. And one thing we found out that most citizens do not know how the police department operates. We, they just don't know what the protocol of many of our operations are. So we invited them back every month to the station and we provided them with a guest speaker within the department. So we, we, we gave them like a 30 minute uh, educational speaker. It could be somebody from robber division, homicide division, helicopter division, canine di division. And so we educated the public. But on the flip side of it, we really found out that citizens and we, we had an open door policy where if they wanted to provide us with any type of crime in the, in the neighborhood that not necessarily they made a report on. So we found out that the communication with the public was paramount, paramount. So we invited, so we opened up this program, this PIP program throughout the whole city. Now, in addition, the chief asked me, he said, well, uh, it's very important that you start the same program with people with disabilities and particularly the deaf and hard of hearing community. So it, it, was, amazing. it was amazing. I went to the very first meeting uh, and everybody there was primarily deaf, some hard of hearing. 
and I had no experience in the culture itself, and I knew no sign language. So I said to myself, I really need to learn some sign language. So I ended up taking a semester class of beginners ASL. Um, and when I, when I took that class coupled with working with, with the community, I learned ASL sign language and it was amazing. So basically since then we have provided the same level of service to the deaf and hard of hearing community. Uh, and it, it really took off and it, it, it really worked out very well. But in addition, there is a couple of neighborhood community centers that I went to. And it, it's amazing. There were other people with disabilities going as far as if maybe they had some type of physical handicap or whether they were blind or they were confined to a wheelchair. And I end up going to this uh, community center and I gave presentations about police service. And it was truly amazing. And I introduced the Positive Interaction Program or PIP uh, to the community. Now, in addition, um, I still noticed that the police department had a lack of involvement with police service to the deaf and hard of hearing and to people with disabilities. So I went back to the chief and I said, chief, you know, we, we really need to look at interpreters for officers when they're on the scenes uh, and or when people come to police stations, we need to make sure that we have uh, a way where a a deaf and hard of hearing person or a person with any type of dis disabilities are comfortable with coming into the stations. And, and I'll get to that in a moment. But what I did notice referring back to the training at the police academy, whether it was new officers that are being hired and are officers that have already graduated from the academy and had many years of service, those officers did not have any type of education how to deal with people with disabilities. So I sat and I, and I with, a chief, with a chief of police and I said, chief, we need to have training. So the chief said, okay, James, what do you recommend? So what I did was I put together a training program for cadets and it's mandatory that they go through the academy and we provide them a four hour class of people with disabilities, the culture, and also the culture of the deaf and hard of hearing. Now, I attended so many seminars throughout the country. Um, and also I visited the uh, state school for the deaf there in Austin, Texas, and I learned so much. So what, what we put together this this program this educational program for the officers is basic education on teaching them the deaf culture what to do and what not to do now so many of my deaf friends and so many of, my, of the deaf members of the pip program some of them corrected me and said you know they don't feel that the deaf and the hard of hearing is a disability uh, actually many of them told me that they're actually proud of being deaf. So I went to so many, they invited me to so many social gatherings, whether it's a party, a wedding, or other meetings. And the, the same thing, so many deaf persons told me that they're actually proud of being deaf and, and don't feel sorry for anybody who is, who is deaf. So uh, I, I learned that. So I passed that on to so many of the officers and that's part of our training. Now, uh, in addition to the training, I told the chief, I said, we need to have interpreters incorporated into the investigations, whether it's a simple traffic stop or whether it's a more serious case, maybe it's involving a, a homicide case or a burglary case where the deaf person needs to uh, be understood. Now, we also learned that ASL is not the same as the English language. So the chief asked me, well, James, what do you recommend? And I actually got with so many interpreting co companies and learned that 
the procedures of getting interpreters out to the scenes, to crime scenes, so the deaf person could uh, make a complete report. So what I did was I found a, a company uh, and, and I introduced it, so they bid on a contract. So mm -hmm. since then, we have a contract with a deaf interpreting service that they operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they will come out to our scene if needed to complete investigation. Because it, we just can't, in some cases, if it's a crime scene and we need to walk that deaf person or a person with any type of disability, we have to walk them through a scene and they can point at possible evidence or they could give us more information at the scene of what happened. It's very important that, that we do so. So uh, we, we did this. Now, we also found out if it's a busy day, it could be in the middle of the day where, you know, Houston is a very big city. The traffic can be congested. I train officers to have patience to wait for that interpreter to come to the scene because it could be a 30 minute or more wait for the officer or for the interpreters to make the scene. So the officers understand that it's very important to do so. Now, we also, I, I, I explored another way is the video remote interpreting devices that were out there uh, and their desktop devices. And I said, Chief, it would be a great idea if we implemented this at the station, if somebody, if a deaf person wanted to come into the stations and, and it could be a simple interaction. It could be somebody asking for directions or it could be something more serious if they needed to make a police report. So we have these devices at the stations and the officers are trained where we, we take that deaf person into the uh, station, uh, into the office, and we complete the investigation or the interaction. It could be a five minute uh, interview or it could be hours long to complete all the details of the report. And so it's very important. And uh, we also found out that there are ADA laws that require police officers uh, throughout the nation. And one of the biggest tips that I give the officers is that we must provide the same amount of service that we provide everybody else. And I keep on making that statement all the time to the, the chief, the command staff, and every single man and woman on the police department, and they understand it. Now, sometimes that years ago, when, when I start implementing a lot of these policies in place that we must get interpreters, you know, some of the uh, command staff, you know, the one of the biggest question was, was cost. How much is this gonna cost us? And I said, well, it doesn't matter. We have to provide this service. So they, they, understood this. Now, in addition, I sat down with our policy making division and I implemented policies and procedures that every police officer that they must abide by and, and they must um, uh, abide by every single case that it has been brought up. Now, I've interviewed a lot of different departments throughout Texas, and I've, I've also interviewed a lot of officers throughout the country in major cities. And I asked them, do you have any type of training in place for your department? I asked them, do you have interpreters? Do you, do you deal with anybody? Uh, do you have any training for people that have any type of other disabilities? And the answer was no. And this was as, as early as last year. And I, I was amazed to hear that. And I said, you really need to do so. So I spoke to so many agencies across the country and they listen and they are going to start, um, start doing what I do here in the city of Houston. Now, I, I'd like to also say I'm very proud. I was invited to be a member of the Houston Deaf Black Advocates. And I'm a chartered member here in the city of Houston. 
and they invited me last August to their national conference in Alabama as a guest speaker, and and I was amazed, and I, I gave a presentation to this organization for a few days, and not only uh, I met people not uh, through all throughout throughout the country, and I learned so much about other disabilities in the black culture. Um, uh, and I also sat through many different lectures. And with that said, there were police departments in other cities throughout the country that they sat me down afterwards and I got with them af weeks afterwards. And I said, it's very important that you abide by the ADA laws and that we, uh, that we work together. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of my deaf friends uh, have told me they, they thought that all the police departments are governed by the same, just one police department throughout the, throughout the country. And what I sort of found this out was that from time to time, I will get a phone call or a message from somebody to say, Officer Savota, I have a problem in my neighborhood. I have an issue. Can you please help me? And I live on a street and a zip code, and I didn't recognize that street here in Houston or that zip code was way off. And I asked him, I said, well, where, what city are you in? And, you know, they said something that they were in Chicago or New York or on the West Coast in California. And they thought that I work, you know, that I can just uh, uh, help them out. And in most cases I did, I ended up calling that department and I provided them with the information they gave me of the police service that they needed. And in addition, what I found out too, I created another alliance and this, and I'm and how this is gonna connect. I connected with businesses, major retailers, your big box stores on trying to reduce crimes in, on, on, on their properties. But what I found out that many of the major stores and uh, some of the biggest pharmacies, when they gave prescriptions to take, for instance, to some people that were deaf and are, they were confined to a wheelchair and I visited those pharmacies. Well, they had no ways to interpret uh, on, say like if a person has questions about taking medications or, or a person that was in a wheelchair, uh, you know, the level of, of the counter was too high. So I got with a lot of these pharmacies and I recommended that they get an interpreting service to help them assist any deaf or hard of hearing person or a person confined to a wheelchair or any other disabilities to help them assist. So they dropped a lot of the, of the counters in the pharmacies and or any other type of uh, services that they may need, like customer services inside the store. But you'd be amazed, I found out that even till recently, so many major companies don't need, know the importance of ADA laws and to assist people with disabilities. And so it's, it's almost an ongoing uh, challenge that I have to working with communities, other police departments, and our businesses to educate and to try to get those accommodations. Now, moving forward, again, I just wanna say that um, my goal uh, before, I still have another couple of good years uh, I'd like to work before I retire, but my goal is, number one, I want to make sure that, uh, that the Houston Police Department and other agencies get on board uh, to assist people with disabilities. And, you know, I've been to some police stations and other cities, and I've noticed they don't have simple things like wheelchair ramps. In other words, if it's an older building where they have steps up to the police station, and I've asked them, I said, well, you know, what do you do uh, when somebody needs, when, they, when they're confined to a wheelchair or, or any other type of disability, what do you do? Um, and I've asked that question for years and, you know, they just had that puzzled look on their face. And I said, you know, we need to get with, with your department and we need to provide a wheelchair ramp uh, and are the interpreters uh, for that, for the deaf and hard of hearing. 
Um, and in addition, Houston's growing. So many of the other uh, cities are growing with people that are coming into America that don't speak English and are struggling. So uh, what we're trying to get the interpreters from other uh, or you know uh, companies to come in and provide the interpreting for other languages. And just in the city of Houston, we have languages, and I was amazed where we have over a hundred diff different type of languages to come in uh, that need when they need police service. Uh, or service to any other major city uh, uh, services that I want to make sure that we do that. So any of anybody that's listening today and moving forward, uh, if you have a question, I'd love to sit down with you. Uh, I'll come, you know, if I can come to your department and if, if I can come to your businesses and sit down in depth and talk about the importance of providing equal access to people with disabilities, I'd love to do that. And I'd like to talk about the challenges that I have noticed in the past of departments that kind of scratch your heads and don't quite understand that and the importance of training younger officers and for generations ahead of us uh, to get educated. So that's, uh, that's and, and then the PIP program has really evolved Matter of fact, we had our first Spanish speaking PIP meeting last week and with the influx of Spanish, Spanish speaking people into the city of Houston, we had a very big turnout. But um, like I say, our deaf and hard of hearing P PIP program has really grown where we have so many new members that didn't know their services out there and for the education of uh, for the, for the officers is out there to better serve everybody. So with that, I'd like to open up for any questions, comments um, uh, out there that anybody may have. Yes, and we have some several questions from the audience and for me as well. So we'll go ahead and start with the questions that are similar. And we'll start with the ones from the audience. One thing that we've noticed is there's a benefit from those in the program that the officers become our advocates. So that way they're more aware of the blocks and that we have and because of socializing with each other. And another benefit from having that interaction with each other, okay, do you have anything you wanna mention about that? Other benefits from interacting? Well, that's, you know, we have broken down the barrier. Um, you know, with the, so many of the, the deaf and hard of hearing and people with other disabilities, they were scared to approach us. They were scared to come to a police station because they, and, and many people have encountered that in the past where officers didn't understand them and officers just did not help them. So that word, I would say the reputation, but that reputation was out there for many years. So we have broken that, and I'd made sure that that barrier was broken down. So that is truly one of the biggest benefits. So if a person has a problem, like with a personal issue and they try to discuss with the police officer, maybe it would be a good idea to bring that problem up in the social event so that, you, and they would know who to better contact at that point, would that be correct? That is a very good question. And you'd be surprised at our meetings. Uh, there are some people that raise their hand up and then they'll ask the question through the interpreter uh, and or if they have another disability, they, they ask the question or they'll make comments. Now, what we have found out in addition that uh, some people, if they maybe feel timid or they're embarrassed if it's a personal issue and very personal sometimes that uh, they have approached me after the meeting and they ask me, can I trust you with this personal information? And I always tell them, of course. So maybe they don't want uh, other people in the room to know their personal problems. And yes, I listen to them and I, you know, I provide them with, with answers to those personal problems. So we have, I have a open door policy with that uh, at the meetings 
And, you know, sometimes I get emails in addition, they have uh, personal problems and it couldn't, sometimes it's may not even be police related. It could be, I almost feel like a counselor sometimes because I do, I do counsel them on personal advice or sometimes they may not understand a contract. If they're signing a contract with a credit card company or the, I've even had people to say, well, on a prescription bottle, what does this mean? Does this mean take one pill a day, or one pill three times a day, or, pay, or take three pills once a day? So I will walk them through that. Now, I'm going to tell you a story, tell everybody a story that I cannot give names, and, but I got a phone call through an interpreter um, a year or two ago from a lady and uh, I could tell she was very nervous and she said that uh, she was going through some very tough times financially and personally and she had two children and she was depressed and she just didn't know what to do. Uh, nobody wanted to help her. Nobody wanted to talk to her. So I listened to her for a long time and she had a lot of personal problems. So I, I talked to her and I, I told her that I promised that she could call me anytime and that I would uh, listen to her and I would get her any help that she needed. And I did. And she, and she would not ask, kept on asking her for a name and where, where, you know, where she lived and she would not tell me. So I honored that, that privacy. Well, a month later, she calls me back up and she sounded much better. And, and she still would not give me her name. And she had two children and she told me, she said, officer, I just wanted to tell you that with you listening to me and getting me the help that I needed, you saved the life of myself, and you saved the life of my two children. And I wanted to tell you, thank you. And then she hung up. So, you know, I often wondering what was her motive? Uh, well, you know, what was she going to do? Was she going to end her life and possibly end the life of her children? So, and that's one example that I give to officers and in the training that I give is, you know, have patience and listen to people and you can hear the need in their voice if they need somebody. So that's a very powerful story that I tell people uh, and, and as part of my training to get people's attention to help people. And I, and I hope that sort of answered your question. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that experience, that story, absolutely. So if a community member um, were to set up a program similar to PIP in their hometowns, Austin, Dallas, how would they go about getting started? What would you recommend? I recommend them for, for them to contact me and my email is below. They can email me or they could Google me. If you just type in HPD PIP, uh, my email address is there and also my phone number is there but I really need to talk to them first. Now, it's very important, and, and I had this challenge many years ago with, uh, with convincing my department of the importance and what I'll need to do, or, or if, if I can convince, or if I can train that particular person of that, of that department or that agency or that company to do so, but, uh, is to sit down with the chief and the command staff and, and give them examples of some of the things that I just spoke about and tell them how important it is to train everybody and to provide these type of services to the public um, and, 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 it, and the ADA laws that's so important and to find the funding for these. Now, when I say this, when I try to convince them of this, one of the biggest, in addition, I'll say, what if it was your loved one? What if it was your mother, father, brother, sister, or child that had a type of disability 
and they fit and they felt challenges. They ran into challenges at your department. Would you want your own family member to have equal access? And that always gets everybody's attention uh, to say, yes, it is very serious to do so. So um, I will make that offer. If anybody wants to contact me in the future uh, to speak to them and or if I can come out to their to a meeting, whether it's a smaller town or a big city in Texas or any other state, I would be more than happy to uh, give them my experience and not just the ex experience, but the success of what I have accomplished with the Houston Police Department. Thanks so much for that. I'm curious about statistics on people who reach out to you um, and, and if they have a disability. So I'm curious if you've seen um, lower numbers in crime since the PIP program has started. Do you have any data that you've collected that you could share? Well, I don't have those exact numbers with me right now, but uh, absolutely the answer is yes, crime has reduced. Uh, since we have started the PIP program, both with community members, because they have that option to contact me. And, uh, and some people are scared to come to the police, are scared to make that phone call, or if they're deaf, if they want to, you know, they text um, the dispatch. So when they contact me, what I will do, I will contact that concerned division uh, where they live, because we have stations, we have patrol stations all over the city. Now, if it's something more serious, like a criminal crime ring, a burglary ring, then I will get with that commander of that station and I will uh, provide this information and they will get their, their staffing of that station to go address this. So yes, we have reduced crimes. Now, in addition, you know, most, and, and I, I just touched on major retailers. The same thing with major retailers for many, many years. They've called the police, whether it was a shoplifting or something that was taking place on their property. They called the police, the police came out, they made arrests, but there were never any crime stats or they never worked with the police. So I opened up that new program where I deal with major retailers and one thing that we have found out that criminals they do they they'll go to different stores they'll go to different crime scene, to different parking lots of retailers and they will commit some of the same crimes now what we have found out about the deaf and hard of hearing um and i made an input in this with the state of texas many years ago they thought it was a good idea to put a sticker on the back windshield of people that were deaf. And it had the ear symbol with the red line with the cross through it. And uh, many agencies throughout the state of Texas and across the country, they thought it would be a good idea on a traffic stop where if officer saw this sticker on their lower windshield, they knew that it was a deaf person when they approached the car. But guess who else noticed this? criminals also noticed that they had this symbol of this ear with a red line going through it. And so criminals started to take advantage of this. And many criminals thought, and I interviewed some criminals many years ago, where they said, well, I, I thought I'd take advantage of this deaf person because they couldn't tell the police, you know, facts about what I look like. So I, I, I call the state of Texas and with other uh, agencies and I says, you know, we need to not do this anymore and don't encourage them to do that. And we found out that crimes against uh, people with different dis disabilities, including deaf and hard of hearing, went down because of that. And in addition, we train officers that when you pull somebody over on traffic, that when they give the signal, you know, they're pointing at the ear, that's universal uh, ADA or the um, symbol that they're deaf, then we train officers 
then that's indication that they're deaf. And that's what I train. And I also train the deaf and hard of hearing on police culture, on what to do and what not to do. Um, and some people, some deaf people, they have the placards that indicate that they're deaf. So some of the interactions when police officers would pull over a deaf person, uh, they would be reaching under their seat or they would be reaching in the glove box for their placard. Uh, and now you get officers, we're giving them verbal commands, you know, not to reach for under their seats because there's been cases where officers have been shot by, you know, criminals that are digging under their seat for a gun or they're reaching in a glove box for a pistol. So I'm training even the deaf culture that if you do get pulled over and if you uh, keep your hands on the steering wheel and simply just point at your ear and then officers will know that, 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 we're, that you're deaf and then now we can proceed from there. Now, in addition that I have trained and what we found out about the deaf culture is many of the deaf, when they want the attention from either other deaf members or the police, well, they'll run up to us and they'll tap people on the shoulder. And that's very common in the deaf culture to tap other people on the shoulder to get their attention. Well, we found out that when, you know, the police culture, we don't like people running up to us from behind and touching us because we don't know if they're going to grab our gun. So that's another thing that I train many of my deaf friends and at deaf meetings, you know, if you see a police officer and want to say hi to them or need their, need their attention, just to walk in front of them and wave your hands and just point at their ear. So we as officers will know that they are deaf because it's unfortunate there has been not in this, not in Houston, but across the country where officers, they they have people run up to them are traffic stops and it's unfortunate that there was uh, some events where some officers had shot a deaf person because they were reaching under the seat and they gave them repeat repeated verbal commands to put their hands on the steering wheel so really trying to get that word out uh, we do it here in houston and want to get that word out to different departments uh, about uh you know police culture also I think that is really great information to share with the disability community because many, you know, different um, disabilities, for, for example, autism, um, you know, coming up close to individuals with autism, they may not feel comfortable with that and um, may run away. And then, you know, the police culture for someone to run away clearly has an impact. So I think just like more exposure and interaction with different kinds of people and discussing behaviors from both sides is really important. So, so happy to see that you're working um, with communities to get that set up. Um, had a question um, about another important thing that to, could reduce crime. Um, I've been myself to a few PIP events and topics um, were on like common crimes, um, like terrorists, um, just different, di different topics that you've done. I'm wondering if you could just share a few of the ones that you guys have provided. Yes, and I'll give you a good example. Now, we have two PIP meetings. Well, we have a lot of them. Uh, and, and just going back, every station has a PIP officer in that part of the town. So that particular, uh, they, they provide guest speakers. But I, what I run, I'm over the whole entire program. And what we have is what we call the citywide chief citywide PIP program. And just to give you an example, we had it earlier this month. And a lot of it is involved with education on how we do our jobs to educate the public on reducing crime. Now, the one that we had this month was quite interesting. Uh, we have a division called TransStar. And what they do here in the city of Houston, and actually in Harris County, they monitor all of the freeways for accidents, uh, any type of events, traffic, 
with the cameras on the freeway. And what we did was we came up and what we found out that so many people uh, in heavy traffic, if they're involved in a, in a minor accident or a major accident, or if they have something as simple as running out of gas, or if they have a flat tire, uh, it can be deadly because people get out of their cars to look at their cars if they have a flat tire, or they will try to change a flat out in heavy traffic with cars literally buzzing by you at 60 miles an hour. And some of those people that are driving 60 miles an hour, they're texting or they're on their phones and they're not paying attention and it can become very deadly. So what we created was a service that's free to the public. Uh, it's called Tow and Go. And what we do is if you call the number with, with Transtar, and this is about, the, and this is an example of a topic where we, we will provide a free tow to get off of the freeway to the nearest parking lot where it's safe, where that tire can be changed out, or you can call your mechanic to have your car towed to wherever you need to. So that's one example that we give uh, the public information on reducing crime and also safety. Now, the next citywide PIP meeting uh, will be in April, uh, I'm sorry, in May, in May, and that meeting will be elder abuse. And we're going to educate, we have an expert that works out of that division that will educate currently what's going on with people that abuse the elderly and it could be neighbors it could be a suspect that meets people at their home and tries to talk them in to signing contracts or to steal money from them or to to do different type of crimes that elderly people don't understand so that topic is going to be on elder abuse and what to look out for and what I'm asking, if anybody wants to get on my mailing list for the future citywide PIP meetings, please email me at my email that's listed on, on the site, james.sabota at houstonpolice.org, and ask me to add their names to the citywide meeting. And I will most certainly like to get you invited to the meeting and come to the meetings. And we also have some resource tables. And some of the resource tables are crime prevention. And some of it, some of the resource tables are some, something like property taxes. You know, property taxes from the Harris County or the counties can be confusing sometimes. So we have uh, experts in those fields. We have uh, uh, mothers against uh, driving, drunk driving. We have resource tables from that. So from time to time, we have different tables, resource tables that you can approach after the meeting. So the, the citywide PIP meetings and also our deaf and hard of hearing P PIP meetings are a valuable meeting to come to and get involved in. All right. So we have another question. Do you have a list of agencies that already have the interaction program for people with disabilities? So do you have a list or? No, I don't. I, I, so many people have contacted me and what, once they felt comfortable with what, and, and I'm kind of disappointed they never got back with me to say they have implemented it. But I search, you know, and they may not call it the positive interaction program. They may call it the community meeting. So it, they, they, they maybe don't call it the PIP. But I, I give the example. Um, I, I most recently, uh, a year or two ago, I went to the Las Vegas Police Department. And, and th this is an example. I went in and I spoke to their command staff. And, you know, Las Vegas is one city, like many other cities, that's growing in population, and they didn't quite understand, understand the concept. Or that person that contacted me, they felt more comfortable with me speaking uh, to their city planners. And, it, and it, it may not just be a chief of police, it could be the mayor 
are the city planners that better understand the importance of providing ADA uh, service and or any type of service to people with disabilities. So, but to answer that question, you know, a lot of them have not gotten back with me on it. I think, I guess it worked, um, but we're, we're, I will not give up on getting with other agencies to try to get them on board. Okay. So if a person is interested and wanting to be aware if their local area has one, I guess they would just contact the police department to find out. Yeah, and actually in the city of Houston, uh, you can go, if you just Google, if you just Google HPD PIP, the PIP, the positive interaction website pops up. And when you go to that, scroll down to the bottom and it will say all PIP meetings and it gives the station, uh, closest to where they live and it has the uh the contact information for that pip officer and then you can click on their email address and they will uh and you can email them and ask them when their meeting is and actually on that website it gives uh, the location and the date of their particular neighborhood pip but if you're a first timer doing that i always encourage you to contact that officer, whether it be email or phone, and confirm the meeting location. Because from time to time, those meeting locations change. Because, say, for instance, if they're doing construction at a station or a community location, and they may change it for that particular month. So from time to time, the locations do change. So it's better to, to contact that that particular officer and to confirm the meeting location. And then that officer will put you on their email address to send future meeting invitations to their meetings. And maybe the officer would have like a different name for their program. So might be a good idea to contact the community line and kind of find out what that program is called, if they have one or if they don't well, have one in order to reach out. If not, maybe you could reach out to James and see if you can figure out how to get started with that department, correct? Yes, you can. You can if, if you just run, down, run into any uh, complications, just email me and I'd be more than happy to um, give you, you know, provide you with the officer's name. And from time to time, officers change uh, assignments. Um, but you know, one thing that I, that I tell people, I tell other agencies, uh, and companies that want to get somebody like me in their department. Uh, you know, I've been in this position in dealing with people with disabilities for, uh, well over 15 years. And the advice that I give to other agencies and our companies that you, if you were to pick a James Savota or somebody like me to, to head a program and to develop a program, is to have that person, he or she, commit to many years and don't just do it, just don't commit for six months or a year because it's important to build a relationship in the community with that officer where the members of that community will feel comfortable with you. And, and I mean, it's like family members. Um, you know, I get people that contact me all the time. They know me by first name and they know that I will help them. So in other words, have that, have that, have that agency, have an officer that will commit for many, many years so they can keep that and maintain that relationship with the community. Well, we're almost out of time. So I'll ask me a couple more questions. So we know in big cities like Houston, they have smaller cities, suburbs around as well. So do you collaborate with them as well, or should they set up their own interactive program? If it's, if it's connected to the city of Houston, and, and we do have that from time to time, yes, I will go to those uh, departments and, and I, will, I will answer questions because, you know, many people that live uh, near Houston, maybe in a smaller suburbs, of Houston, well, a lot of them do come into Houston to work and they may drive in, to, you know, you may have some fine people that live in Spring, Texas, 
um, or you may have people that live close by. Yes, I will interact with them in a positive way where, where we will provide that. But if it's counties or cities that's not connected, I recommend uh, them to go to that agency or that, or I will contact that agency uh, to provide that person with some, some type of help that they may need. So other big cities could possibly copy that model as well. Instead of starting with the smaller local police, maybe you want to go ahead and start with the bigger city to see if they have more support. Yes, very Let's important. See. So the last question, I know we have several questions in regards to SQL and I don't, we don't really have much time to answer. So there may be people who can contact you to get more information about how it is that you work with T T call as well. TCOLE that, or T that, that I work with with what? T C O L E or T Cole. Uh, yes. And actually, I am a T Cole uh, Test Commission for Law Enforcement Education. I am a certified instructor. Um, and it's very important that any officer that I that you know that wants to teach us in other Texas uh, departments is very important to meet the standards. They they have to be T Cole certified and they have to take you know they have to get the educational and they got to be t -Cole certified so it's very important that any texas agency that if they get somebody on board to do what i'm doing that they must be t -Cole certified and i am certified by the, by the state of texas all right thank you so maybe we have one last Right. So I wanted to thank you for joining us for this webinar, and we will have the recording and the transcript posted on the page that is there on the slide. And also in the email that you receive, you will also have the link there that you can click on so you don't have to search and find it. Also, the email that you receive will have a survey in it, and it will ask for your feedback and what your thoughts were about this presentation, how what recommendations you have for improvement, if you suggest any new topics for the future presentations as well. We always enjoy having new ideas for topics that we want to be heard. And so we appreciate your response to the survey. If you don't want to respond to the survey, you can always email me as well. And my email address is there and you can provide me with your feedback and ideas that way for the presentation. And so, lastly, last thing to wrap up. I'd like to just give a shout out to Matthew Dickens. Um, I, I knew him for many years when he was here in Houston, and I'm so proud of him for getting the job there in Austin. He's just a great guy. So, uh, Matthew, thank you for uh, contacting me and reaching out to me. And lastly, I, I look forward to work with me, everybody in the future uh, for training. And if anybody has a question, please do so. Thank you again. Thank you. Have a great day. Oh, bye.